Hello, uh, my name is John Kissel. I'm a gastroenterologist uh, at Mayo Clinic specializing in the care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. My clinical and research interests uh, specifically relate to inflammatory bowel disease and cancer, uh, more specifically colon cancer and the risk that patients with uh, chronic colitis, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's colitis face from that potential complication. Um, the uh, risk of colorectal cancer in ulcerative colitis is well established. There are large population level studies that show that that risk is probably two to two and a half fold uh, the, the risk we see in the general population. So this is a significant problem uh, for patients and clinicians. Um, the landscape of how we uh, care for patients with chronic colitis has been changing over time and so there's considerable need to update um, our knowledge on this area and that's why uh, this recent study is uh, of, of particular interest. The uh, St. Mark's Hospital in the United Kingdom where this study was conducted has one of the largest and longest running surveillance cohorts of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, meaning patients with ulcerative colitis who are getting regular colonoscopies at two-year intervals to try to screen for and prevent uh, for this uh, increased risk of colon cancer. Um, we think that the risk may actually be decreasing over time, but in this large uh, data set with over 15,000 years of patient follow-up, it looks as though the risk had decreased substantially from the 70s and into the 80s, but has remained roughly stable uh, since that time. Uh, about 5% of this patient population did develop colon cancer, uh, and that's uh, similar to the lifetime risk that, that the general population faces. However, this group of patients was under very, very close observation and getting colonoscopy much more frequently than is advised for average risk patients. Um, the, the global risk amounted to about a third of a percent per year, which is still relatively small uh, in absolute terms. Uh, the study had several very important findings. Uh, first and foremost, that uh, the patients who were getting surveillance colonoscopies for this problem, as opposed to those who were not compliant with their surveillance, uh, were found, if they had cancer, to have that cancer at a much earlier stage. And that's important because the stage of the cancer directly correlates to the survival and the outcome of the cancer. So patients who had their cancers found early in the surveillance group tended to do much, much better after the cancer diagnosis. They tended to live much longer and many were found at curable stage. Um, the study also wanted to look at the uh, relative strength of chromoendoscopy, that's a dye spray of the colon at the time of a colonoscopy as opposed to our conventional white light exams. Uh, about half the patients uh, in the last uh, decade have received chromoendoscopies in this cohort and the rate of detection of precancerous changes was about twice as high in the chromoendoscopy group. About 8% of patients had a precancer found over the duration of the study by chromoendoscopy about 4% by white light endoscopy. There may be some advantages to that higher detection rate uh, that, for instance, if you find a, a low-grade precursor lesion, a low-grade dysplasia, or an adenoma lesion, it may be uh, much more amenable to endoscopic therapy. And in fact, in this group of patients, in this uh, single center study, uh, the rate of colectomy, or removal of the colon, uh, for the finding of a precancer did decrease over time. And I think that's, that, that's important to note uh, because that's something that we're doing in our practice um, uh, broadly in the United States and, and here at Mayo. Um, the use of chromoendoscopy over white light uh, has recently been endorsed in a set of, uh, of guidelines uh, and there may be uh, individual factors for each patient as to whether or not their physician chooses to use that test. It was also reassuring in the uh, St. Mark's uh, cohort that uh, the risk of interval cancer, that is a, a colon cancer that uh, is diagnosed between surveillance exams, was roughly the same for those who got chromoendoscopy as opposed to white light. So I think for patients uh, and providers who don't have access to the chromoendoscopy tool, that high definition white light uh, surveillance endoscopy um, is an effective option. Uh, there was another recent study uh, published last year that showed that that, that tool does reduce uh, the risk of death from colon cancer, and so that's important to use if it's, if it's available. Um, 
One other very interesting finding for the study is that uh, patients with high-grade dysplasia, uh, almost 50% of patients who had that finding on their colonoscopy uh, had a synchronous or, or um, a colon cancer elsewhere in their, in their bowel at the same time. And so we're often asked, well, if we can just remove a low-grade dysplasia uh, or treat a low-grade polyp, why can't we do the same thing for high-grade dysplasia? And the answer is that about half of patients who are found to have high-grade dysplasia also have cancer, and, and we cannot take that risk. That is unacceptably high. So I think that is, for me, uh, in caring for the patients who, who have that problem, this, this information reaffirms what our current practice is and also fits very well, I think, with, uh, with current guidelines published by uh, the American Gastroenterology Association and the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Uh, in summary, the uh, St. Mark's cohort study, uh, this recent publication by uh, Dr. Choi and colleagues in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, I think affirms a lot of what we're doing in our practice. Uh, it helps us understand the relative merits and risks and benefits of using chromoendoscopy as opposed to white light endoscopy. Um, and it's a very important uh, update to our medical literature on this topic. Thank you very much for your attention.